Hi, everyone. So welcome to the February installment of the ICPAE webinar series. The ICPAE or International Commission on Planetary Atmospheres and Their Evolution. We seek to promote professional exchange within the global community for planetary atmospheres research. And through this webinar series, we hope to be able to showcase the latest scientific methods and results from researchers from all over the world. And this webinar series is funded by our parent organization, IMS, or the International Association of Meteorology and Atmospheric Sciences. If you haven't done so already, do subscribe to our newsletter. There's a QR code on the screen. So you can be so you can stay updated on what is next in the webinar series. You can also visit our website. There's a link there on the left at www.iamas.org slash ICPAE slash webinar to check out the previous webinars. Recordings of these previous webinars are available on both our YouTube and our Bilibili channels. And so this webinar today will also be recorded and uploaded to those channels. And so for today, we are really excited to have a well-known name in exoplanetary atmospheres to speak to us. Heather Knudsen is a professor of planetary science in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology. She obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Physics at Johns Hopkins University in 2004 and her PhD in Astronomy from Harvard in 2009. She then spent two years as a Miller Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, before beginning her faculty position at Caltech. She has received many awards over the years, including the Annie Jump Kennedy Award and Newton Lacey Pierce Prize from the American Astronomical Society, as well as the Paolo Farina Nella Prize from the European Society. Her research focuses on using present day properties of exoplanetary systems to explore how this planetary system form and evolve. And over the years, she and her collaborators have used telescope observations to pin down key properties of exoplanet atmospheres, including the temperatures, composition, the presence or absence of aerosols, and atmospheric escape. And for today, her talk is titled Exploring the Mysterious of Super Earths and Mini Neptunes. And I will hand it over to her. It's a pleasure to be here today. And um, I know that uh, the folks listening span a pretty broad range of backgrounds and interests related to planetary atmospheres. So um, my hope today is to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the sort of recent developments in studies of exoplanetary atmospheres. Um, this is a relatively new and rapidly growing field. Uh, we currently know of more than 5,000 um, planets orbiting nearby stars. And um, that has provided us with a sort of rich diversity of planetary systems to study. And so what I wanna tell you about today is, is some of the um, detailed characterization studies that we're doing for these planetary systems. And in particular, um, the question that I, my group is, uh, wants to address is um, when we look at exoplanetary systems, we see that many of them have properties, including sort of composition and architectures that are very different than those of the planets in the solar system. And so we'd like to understand, you know, what the forks in the road are for planet formation and evolution that might lead to produce one kind of planetary system versus another. So how can we explain the diversity of exoplanetary systems from a sort of formation perspective? All right. So um, the first thing that uh, we should ask is, how do we actually find planets orbiting nearby stars? Uh, there are multiple techniques for finding planets around nearby stars, but the most successful and widely used technique to date is the transit technique. So this relies on um, measuring the brightness of the star. And if you have a planet that passes in front of the star as seen from the Earth, that planet will block part of the star's light and cause it to periodically dim in brightness. So the video that you just saw was actually a video of the sun and the planet moving in front of it was Venus uh, transiting the sun from a, an event about 10 years ago. So this is in essence, the signal that we look for around nearby stars. The difference being that we can't actually resolve the disk of the star. So we're just looking at a point of light and searching for um, stars whose light periodically dims due to the presence of a transiting planet. 
So the most successful planet hunting mission to date was the Kepler survey. Um, this was a space telescope that stared at a patch of sky located near the constellation Cygnus. Um, and so the, its field of view is about 100 square degrees. And so it stared at this patch of sky um, for almost four years continuously. And uh, it searched the light curves of about 150,000 mostly sun-like stars to look for evidence of transiting planets. So this mission uh, detected thousands of new transiting planets and planet candidates. And uh, much of what we know about sort of the population of exoplanets uh, comes from this survey. So one of the key takeaways of the Kepler mission was the realization that most planetary systems don't look like the solar system. And in order to illustrate that, I think it's useful to think about the inner region of the solar system uh, and compare that to some of the exoplanetary systems detected by Kepler and other surveys. So the reason I'm focusing on the inner part of the planetary system is that um, the transit technique is most sensitive to close-in planets. So for a given orbital alignment, the probability that we will see the planet pass in front of the star is higher when the planet is very close to the star because you have a greater range of orbital orientations where you see the transit. As the planet moves further away, the transit probability decreases. So um, this region that I've chosen to show here represents the effective search region of the Kepler survey. So Kepler could find planets at Mercury-like distances, at Venus-like distances, and in limited cases, even out to Earth-like distances, but not really any further than that. Uh, in this drawing, I've made the distances to scale and I've made the planet sizes to scale, not to the same scale, otherwise it would be hard to see the planets, but just to give you a sense of the relative sizes. So here for comparison are some of the exoplanetary systems detected by Kepler. One of the earliest and, and sort of best studied systems is a system called Kepler 11. So it has six transiting planets, five of which orbit inside the orbit of Mercury in the solar system, and all of which are appreciably bigger than any of the terrestrial planets in the solar system. So these planets are smaller than Neptune, but significantly bigger than the Earth. And we think that is because um, they have a, a few percent by mass hydrogen and helium rich atmosphere, which inflates their radii. But I will justify that in more detail in a little bit. Um, Kepler and other surveys also found another population of planets, which we um, refer to as super Earths. So these planets are typically closer in and a little bit smaller. And we think these planets have um, Earth-like rock iron uh, bulk compositions with minimal atmospheres on top. The key point, though, is that um, this survey and, and other similar surveys have revealed that um, there are quite frequently planets in a region which is empty in the solar system. So we often find planets inside the orbit of Mercury, and that many of those planets are relatively large compa compared to the terrestrial planets of the solar system and that some of those planets can also have low density envelopes. Again, these are all properties that are anomalous or maybe unexpected um, coming from the perspective of the solar system. So we can also view the results of the Kepler survey statistically. So this is probably uh, the key takeaway from this mission, which is the um, frequency or number of planets per star as a function of planet size. And this is corrected for survey completeness. So this is telling us about the underlying planet population. And you can see that um, planets that are smaller than about four Earth radii dominate this population. So just to put that in perspective, the size of Neptune is about four times the size of the Earth. So this um, tail on the right is a, a small population of gas giant planets close in but most of these planets are smaller than Neptune, yet bigger than the Earth. Uh, it's also quite striking that this um, peak is bimodal. So this tells us that there are two distinct subpopulations of planets. Um, and again, uh, just drawing your attention to the fact that this is all for planets with orbital periods less than 100 days. And so this is um, just outside the orbit of Mercury. So this is limiting ourselves to the region where the Kepler survey had the highest completeness and for which we can make um, more confident uh, sort of histograms of the population.
So our current sort of working hypothesis is that these two populations represent two kinds of planets. So on the left, the smaller size of planet, we think are planets that are, have rocky compositions, similar to that of the earth, but more massive. So they're a little bit bigger in size than the earth. And that the peak on the right represents the same population of earth-like planets with a little bit of a hydrogen rich atmosphere on top. So if you have a, a planet, which is one to 10 times the mass of the earth, primarily rocky, um, you add a few percent by mass of hydrogen and helium gas, you can increase the apparent size of the planet to match the peak that you see here. Uh, so this gap in between the two peaks is often referred to as the evaporation valley. Uh, it's the idea being that it's sort of the population bifurcates. You either lose all of your hydrogen atmosphere or you keep all of it, but there's not really many planets in between. Um, the implication here being that all of these planets formed with hydrogen rich atmospheres and that a subset of those planets, the smallest and most highly irradiated lost uh, their primordial atmospheres. So again, this is a pretty radical departure from the picture we have in the solar system. These rocky cores are bigger, they form earlier, they have hydrogen rich atmospheres and then a subset of them lose those atmospheres. So um, that was just an assertion. Let me lay out some of the evidence for why we think this story makes sense. So one compelling piece of evidence is when we look at this population in two dimensions, so here I have planet size relative to the earth on the y-axis, and I have orbital period in days on the x-axis. So you can see again, the two populations of planets, and uh, you can see that the, the smaller sized planets are preferentially located closer in, whereas the larger planets are preferentially located further out. So this fits with this idea that um, the planets all formed with hydrogen rich atmospheres, but the ones that were closer in and more highly irradiated had those atmospheres stripped away while the more distant planets kept them. And you can, with more detailed models, try and match the um, period dependent slope of the evaporation valley in order to provide a more detailed sort of constraint on the properties of this population. But that's kind of the basic picture. So there are a couple of sanity checks that we can make. Um, I will sort of preface this by saying that this whole story um, involves interpreting observations of planets where we know their size, but not their mass and therefore not their composition. Um, so it necessarily means leaning pretty heavily on our models of atmospheric mass loss. And we're not entirely sure that we should trust those models of atmospheric mass loss because Atmospheric mass loss is kind of a, a big umbrella that covers a lot of kind of complicated processes. It can depend on things like magnetic fields, stellar wind strength, stellar you know, high energy radiation history. So there are a lot of uncertainties um, that get kind of swept under the rug with these model population level models. So um, if we want a sanity check that this basic story is correct, there are a couple of things that we can do. Uh, the first is we can actually measure masses for a subset of these planets. So when the planet goes in front of the star, it blocks part of the star's light. That amount of light that it blocks tells us the size of the planet. We need a different technique in order to measure the mass of the planet. And that technique um, for this particular study is the radial velocity technique. So as the planet orbits its star, it tugs on the star and we see the star red shifted or blue shifted as it moves towards us or away from us. So the, the size of the, the star's motion tells us the mass of the planet um, orbiting it. So if we focus on this population on the lower left, so these are some of the smaller super Earths, which are located on orbital periods typically of less than one day. Um, these planets are relatively favorable target for targets for radial velocity studies because they're so close in, um, they have a greater effect on the star and it's easier to detect that Doppler shift and measure their mass. So um, here now is the set of those planets for which we have measured masses to date. And this is a, a study, sort of a, a meta study compilation of published results um, that was made by Faye Dye, who's a um, postdoc here at Caltech. So you can see when you plot these planets on a um, mass versus radius diagram, uh, for comparison, we're overplotting 
theoretical curves corresponding to different bulk compositions for the planet. So on the bottom, the gray curve is for a planet that was made of pure iron. Uh, the green curve is for an Earth-like mix of rock and iron. The um, tan curve is a pure rock planet, and the blue curve is a pure water planet. And so you can see, you know, albeit with some scatter, that this population of close-in planets does indeed lie uh, quite nicely on top of the Earth-like bulk composition curve. So this is the first kind of confirmation that, that we're not uh, too far off with this story, that when we look at the close-in planets that we think should have lost their primordial atmospheres, that we see that indeed they have bulk compositions um, similar to that of the Earth. The second sanity check that we can do is we can ask for the subset of planets that have hydrogen-rich atmospheres, can we actually detect the absorption from their atmosphere when they pass in front of the star. So this is a way to directly constrain the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere. So the idea is that planets with hydrogen rich atmospheres will have a low mean molecular weight. Their atmospheres are very puffy and extended. And when they uh, pass in front of the star, we see a wavelength dependent transit depth. If we compare wavelengths where the atmosphere is opaque to other wavelengths where the atmosphere is transparent. So that wavelength dependent transit depth tells us about the presence of different absorbers in the atmosphere and also about the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere. So this is an example of an observation for one sub-Neptune K218b that came out recently. And in this case, you can see that, um, so if the planet was a ball of rock, we would expect this uh, spectrum to be flat. The size of the planet would be the same at all the wavelengths that we measure it. Instead, you can see that there's a wavelength dependent variation in the size of the planet. So in red is the best fit model and in blue is uh, different sort of confidence intervals for that model. Um, so this retrieved model has a relatively low mean molecular weight, meaning that this is, um, can only be matched by a hydrogen dominated atmosphere. And so this is a direct confirmation that at least for this sub-Neptune, um, it does indeed have a primordial hydrogen and helium atmosphere. This is a really difficult measurement to make, even with space telescopes like Hubble. So to date, there are only six sub-Neptunes that have been observed, two of which um, have hydrogen-rich atmospheres. So the one I'm showing you is, is one, and there's a second planet like it. Um, the other four appear to be featureless. Uh, that might mean that they are have a um, higher mean molecular weight atmosphere, such as a steam atmosphere. Um, we know from their bulk densities, they're not pure rock, um, but it also might mean that there's more complicated things going on like high altitude cloud layers that could mask the absorption. So um, I think the evidence is ambiguous for the four non-detections, but for the two where we detect an absorption signal, it's clear that their atmospheres are hydrogen rich. Okay. So uh, we can ask, what created the evaporation valley. So I've laid out a story where all the rocky planets form with hydrogen and helium rich atmospheres, and those atmospheres are stripped away from a subset of the closest in planets. That story um, corresponds to the left-hand scenario in this list of three, which is that the atmosphere is stripped away by photoevaporative mass loss. So the idea here is that the energy to remove the atmosphere comes from the absorption of stellar EUV or other high energy photons, which heat the atmosphere and drive an outflow. Um, that's sort of the default or sort of canonical model used to interpret this population. But there are several recent studies that have proposed alternative models. So one scenario of model or one scenario um, is called core powered mass loss. So the idea there is that the energy that drives the outflow is actually coming from the cooling planetary core. Um, when these planets form, they have residual heat from formation that gets radiated outward um, that can heat the atmosphere. And if this heat source is significant enough, it could also um, contribute to or even drive an outflow. Um, another possibility is that this is not actually a story about mass loss at all, that instead we have a um, range of core masses for the planets and that less massive and more highly irradiated cores are unable to accrete a hydrogen rich atmosphere to begin with. So in this case, it's not that they had an atmosphere and lost it, but rather that they never acquired one in the first place. So 
if we want to differentiate between these three explanations, it would be really useful to be able to observe young transiting planets from this population to see whether or not they are actually losing their atmospheres, and if so, to measure their atmospheric mass loss rates, because these three theories give us different predictions for what we should see. In the photoevaporative mass loss model, we would expect the mass loss to be rapid and early because that the peak of the stellar EUV flux is when the star is very young and magnetically active. In the core powered mass loss models, uh, those tend to predict somewhat more extended period of mass loss, so longer and slower. And then if the differences are primordial, we should expect to see little to no mass loss, even when we look at very young systems. So that's the hope. Um, if we could measure mass loss for young planets from this population, we might be able to differentiate between these competing explanations for this bimodal population. We can leverage the transit technique to measure atmospheric outflows. The idea here is similar to the one that I mentioned before, which is if we look during the transit when the planet passes in front of the star, and we look at a wavelength where the outflow is opaque, the planet will appear much bigger than it does at other wavelengths where the outflow is optically thin. So the idea here is we're measuring the wavelength dependent transit depth, but focusing more narrowly on particular absorption lines that would be optically thin in the very extended diffuse hydrogen and helium rich outflow. So um, this program that I'm about to tell you I'm going to tell you about is one that was led by a grad student in my group, Michael Zhang. So um, he was combing through the TESS data. So TESS is a new all sky transit survey that had just started a couple years ago. And it's been great for discovering nearby transiting planet systems that are favorable for these sort of detailed characterization studies. He noticed that one of the new candidate systems detected by TESS was a pair of planets orbiting a relatively young, just 400 million years old, and relatively nearby, just 23 parsecs, that's extremely close, um, star. And so this system turned out to be a great target for trying to detect these outflows. And so you can see from the plot, this is just showing orbital period versus planet size, where you see the two populations. And in blue and in red, I'm indicating the positions of the two transiting planets in this system. So you can see that they're both, um, the sizes of both of them places them in the sub-Neptune population, but in particular, the inner planet is kind of on the inner edge of where that population we think can survive. So that these system, um, particularly the planet B might be a good candidate for a planet that is in the process of losing its primordial envelope. So in order to characterize our search for evidence of outflows from these two planets, um, Michael observed the system with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, HST can um, observe the transit in the Lyman Alpha line of hydrogen. So this is a UV line, um, which has a very strong absorption cross section. So this is even for an outflow gonna be a um, nice strong absorption signal and um, measured the depth of the transit in Lyman Alpha when the planet passed in front of the star. So um, I'll draw your attention to the figure on the bottom right. So this is the Lyman Alpha line profile that we observe. You'll notice that it's bimodal. That's because the center of the line is blocked by absorption from the interstellar medium. So we can't observe the core of this line. We can only observe the wings on either side of the line core. And so we can bin the data into a blue wing and a red wing. And that's what I'm plotting in the top right is the time series as the planet goes in front of the star in the blue wing and in the red wing of the Lyman Alpha line. As you can see, there appears to be a transit signal in both wings, um, maybe a little stronger and better characterized in the blue wing because we have more photons in that wing, a little noisier and less well characterized in the red wing. And we can match that signal, um, which is much larger than the white light transit of the planet. So this signal is, is so deep that it must come from an atmospheric outflow. And I should mention also that this is a light curve for planet C, the outer planet in the system. Uh, and so we can try and interpret that light curve using um, 3D atmospheric mass loss models. So on the left is a, a snapshot from one of those models where you can see the structure of the outflow. 
And if we use that model to make a, a light curve, you get the blue and red lines on the plot. So the model does a good job matching the blue wing, not such a good job matching the red wing. I'd be happy to discuss that later if anyone has questions. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, if there's a clear detection of an outflow and the geometry of the outflow, at least in the blue wing, seems to be reasonably well matched by our photo evaporative mass loss model. We don't detect an outflow from the innermost planet, planet C, which was kind of surprising. Uh, so one possible explanation is that the inner planet has already lost its primordial atmosphere. Um, but I think there are a lot of uncertainties around if whether or not there are other things that might mask or reduce uh, the amplitude of that signal, including scenarios with um, a water-rich kind of high mean molecular weight atmosphere. Okay, um, Lyman alpha is not the only line that we can use to study outflows. There's another line, which is a line, metastable line of helium, which was only um, sort of did, uh, only really developed as, as an idea recently. So um, a pair of papers in 2018, the Klopchik and Harada laid out the theory of um, this line. Spake et al. had the first detection of the line in an exoplanet atmosphere. Um, the, the basic premise is that this is a line which is only populated in very low density regions of the atmosphere. Um, the metastable state gets depopulated in the, the denser lower atmosphere. Um, and it's a strong enough line that we can see it uh, for planets with outflowing atmospheres. It's useful because it's in the infrared, meaning we don't need a space telescope to see it. And also, um, there's no uh, equivalent absorption from the interstellar medium. So unlike Lyman alpha, we can see the whole line, including the line core, which um, lets us better probe the lower velocity part of the outflow closer to the planet. So it's very complementary to Lyman alpha, but in some ways even more sensitive than Lyman alpha to the outflows. So uh, for this study, um, which was again led by um, my grad student, Michael Zhang, uh, he again found an interesting two-planet um, candidate system detected by TESS. So this system is around the star TY 560, uh, which is a 700 million year old star, again, relatively nearby, just 32 parsecs away. And here you can see the two planets in the size period space. And again, they're both large enough that they look like sub-Neptunes. They should, we think, um, have hydrogen-rich atmospheres. And if they do, because they orbit close to a young active star, we should see those atmospheres escaping into space. So um, Michael observed uh, this planet, the innermost planet, planet B with the Keck telescope, um, the near spec spectrograph. So this is a plot of the excess absorption as a function of wavelength um, across the duration of the transit. So wavelength on the x-axis, the red lines mark the location of the planet absorption uh, from metastable helium as a function of time. Because the planet's moving a little bit towards us at the start of the transit and a little bit away from us at the end of the transit, the location of the line isn't constant. It has a little slope to it, uh, which is just caused from the planet's orbital velocity. Um, the white horizontal lines mark the start and the end of the transit. So if there's an escaping atmosphere, we expect to see absorption primarily um, in the middle region of the plot, maybe with a little bit of a tail um, kind of around those lines. If the outflow is bigger than the planet, it can have a duration that's a little bit bigger. Uh, sure enough, you see that there's a yellow sort of track following the red line. So that yellow track is the absorption signal from the planet. And the fact that it has a slope that matches the red line is a confirmation that that really is a planetary signal, that it's not from the star. Uh, and the magnitude of that signal means that it's, it's a pretty clear detection. It's a little hard to see significance uh, with this kind of color scaling, but I'll show you a different uh, version of this plot in just a minute. So um, this is now a second sub-Neptune planet around a young star with a clearly detected outflow that we can use to quantify its present day mass loss rate. So how do we do that? We could do that by comparing it to um, 3D photoevaporative models with different mass loss rates. So shown on the left is our fiducial model for this planet. Um, we can take that model and we can make a prediction for the absorption spectrum during transit. So this is now bending across the transit and saying what's the magnitude of the excess absorption as a function of wavelength. The centers of the helium lines are shown in uh, pink. The data are shown in blue. 
and the model prediction is shown in red. So you can see that the model significantly over predicts the magnitude of the signal. And it also predicts that the gas should be much more blue shifted than what we see. That's just because the stellar wind um, pushes the outflow away from the star and towards us. So the, the telescope cartoon and the star cartoon just give you a sense of the geometry. So we're looking towards the star with the planet in between. So when the gas is flowing away from the star, we see that as a blue shift. So this is pretty puzzling. Um, I think the magnitude of the absorption is consistent in general with the photoevaporative story, but the detailed geometry of the outflow is quite different than we expected. So another thing that we can do is we can explore um, a range of different models. So there are a number of assumptions we have to make in order to calculate the, uh, to predict the outflow geometry. So our fiducial model, we used um, a, this measured Lyman alpha and X-ray flux for the star to predict the high energy kind of heating factor. Um, we assumed that the atmospheric composition was uh, solar or stellar, which is to say it matches that of the star. And we assumed a baseline stellar wind velocity of about 400 kilometers per second. Again, you know, extrapolating from the sun uh, to a star that's a bit younger and a bit more active. In order to match, better match the signal that we see in the data, um, we can make a number of changes. So we wanna reduce the magnitude of the signal and we wanna reduce the size of the blue shift. Um, we can do that by reducing the UV flux. Less UV flux means lower mass loss rate, lower mass loss rate means less absorption. Um, we can also do it by increasing the mean molecular weight of the outflow. So less hydrogen, more um, carbon and oxygen and iron and other things like that. And we can also do it by confining the outflow more narrowly into a cone. And so that we can do by increasing the velocity of the stellar wind. So if we do all those things, we do a much better job matching the data, not perfect, but better. But uh, it's not clear if those are actually correct things to do. So it's pretty, we've measured the stellar flux pretty well. It's unlikely that we are off by a factor of three. So that's probably stretching it. Um, it's very possible that it could have a, a different atmospheric composition. So that one's an easy possibility. And we really don't know much about the stellar wind velocity. So I think that one's also you know, a very plausible um, factor. Okay. Um, one other key question is whether these two planets for which we detected outflows are representative of the broader population of young sub-Neptunes, or if there's some intrinsic planet-to-planet -planet variability due to things like different magnetic field strengths, different rotation rates, um, and that might affect the outflow that we see. And so um, Michael's next steps are to um, increase the sample size. So we've observed three planets to date. Uh, he wants to observe an additional five, which are shown in period size space on the left. So we want to know if the out types of outflows that we see are representative of, of the whole or if there's a big diversity of outflow properties. Um, so that is a survey that uh, we're doing in the helium line using Keck. Um, Michael is also going to um, reobserve some of these systems in Lyman Alpha with the Hubble Space Telescope. So he's going to get additional observations of the original Lyman Alpha detected planet and its companion and also observe um, TY 560, which is the planet where we see the helium detection of an outflow to see if we can um, also get a, a Lyman alpha detection of the outflow. Okay, so um, that's the story so far, um, albeit with a small sample size. I think the takeaway here is that the mass loss story is more or less correct, that these planets probably start with hydrogen rich envelopes that are stripped away. Um, the mass loss rates that we see are maybe a little bit lower than predicted by the photoevaporative model, but it's not yet clear whether that's just geometry or whether that is a real meaningful difference in the mass loss rate. And, and so for that, I think we need more and better observations. So um, that is really a story about atmospheres and atmospheric mass loss, but I think there's another really interesting story to think about here, which is to ask why is it that we see such large planets in the first place? So 
This entire population is a population of Earth-like rocky cores that have masses that range between one and 10 times the mass of the Earth. So why is it that all of these other stars are making rocky planets that are so much bigger than the rocky planets that we see in the solar system? And that is kind of an interesting question in and of itself. So uh, one possible answer to that question might have to do with the presence or absence of outer gas giants in these systems. So we know that in the solar system, the presence of Jupiter and Saturn in particular um, has potentially uh, quite a large influence on both the supply of material to form rocky planets in the inner disk, and also just on the, the structure and evolution of the inner disk. So um, there's no question that giant planets can have an outsized influence on, on interplanetary systems. So what are the things that they might do? So one is if you have an outer gas giant planet, it could restrict the flow of small solids to the inner disk. So in that case, you might expect these super earth systems don't have outer gas giant companions. And so they had a, a very solid rich environment to form in, unlike the solar system, maybe having Jupiter and Saturn kind of starved the inner disk of material. Um, outer giant companions can also um, dynamically interact with small bodies in the inner part of the system. So you could cause collisions between planetesimals. You could cause planets to be ejected or to accrete onto the stars. So you could disrupt um, inner systems and kind of thin things out or keep large planets from accreting in the first place. Um, so those are both, you would expect an anti-correlation. Um, presence of a giant planet means no big things in the inner disk. This last one is, is more of the opposite, that perhaps um, the presence of an outer giant is a signal that the disk was relatively large and rich in solids to where it was e able to easily form a giant planet. And perhaps those kinds of disks are also the kinds of disks that have plenty of material around to form large inner planets. So in this last scenario, we expect a positive correlation. Systems with super-Earths should frequently be accompanied by outer gas giant planets. And so we can directly test these stories by asking, um, is our, what, what is the occurrence rate of outer gas giants in systems with inner super-Earths? Are outer gas giant companions relatively common or relatively rare in those systems? So... Although our transit surveys have been really wonderful for telling us about the properties of inner planetary systems, I mentioned earlier on that they're not really sensitive to the presence of distant outer planets. So if we think about how far in separation does the Kepler survey probe, um, this is now showing you the solar system with distances to scale, sizes to scale, not to the same scale. Um, the Kepler survey observed for three years, and so it was able to detect planets out as far as the distance of the Earth, about 1 AU, but not really any further than that. So even if many of the stars that Kepler observed had outer Jupiters, and even if those Jupiters happened to have exactly the right alignment to pass in front of their star, um, Kepler just didn't observe long enough to see most of them transit even once. So um, we can turn to the radial velocity technique. So the radial velocity technique is better for long-term monitoring. Um, their radial velocity surveys have been going for 20, even 30 years in some cases. So for some of these stars, we can get relatively long baselines needed to detect distant giant planets. The radial velocity technique also is much less sensitive to the orbital orientation of the planet. It doesn't have to be exactly edge on to see it. It's okay if its orbit is tilted a little bit with respect to our line of sight. So um, this is also a great way to pick up planets that don't transit their star. So um, we can focus on the systems where we know there are inner super Earths and we can use the radial velocity technique to search for outer gas giant companions. The limitation, of course, is that for many of these systems, the inner planets were only detected relatively recently. So when we make plot our radial velocity data as a function of time, we might only have a couple of years of measurements. And if we're interested in detecting Jupiter analogs, a couple years of measurements isn't enough to sample the full orbit of the planet. But in this case, we don't actually need to sample a full orbit to answer the basic question, which is, does this system have an outer gas giant planet? Yes, no. 
just the presence of a trend in the radial velocity data with this um, duration of a couple of years is already enough to tell us there's something big in the outer part of the system. And so that is enough to do the statistical study, even without knowing in detail the orbits and masses of these outer companions. So um, this was a project that um, a former grad student of mine, Marta Bryan, did as part of her thesis work. She's now um, a Hubble fellow at UC Berkeley, has been continuing this. But um, I'll give you the key takeaway from her, her thesis project here, which is um, if we look at systems with outer companions, we want to know if those systems are more likely to have terrestrial Earth-like planets in the inner region, or if they're more likely to have super-Earths and sub-Neptunes. So MARTA's study and another independent study by Zhu and Wu that came out at the same time found that um, there was a strong positive correlation between Jupiter analogs and these big super Earths and sub Neptunes. So most many super Earths and sub Neptunes have outer Jovian companions. Um, this result is a really interesting one from a planet formation perspective. It's um, mo motivated a number of follow on uh, modeling studies thinking about how and, and why this might be the case. Um, I'll give you a more detailed example in a minute. Um, but for now, I'll just uh, point out that uh, this result suggests that having a Jupiter analog doesn't hurt, the, doesn't prevent the formation of inner super Earths, doesn't starve the disk of material, or at least not in a way that matters. It doesn't dynamically disrupt these systems in a way that um, prevents them from growing large. Rather, it seems to either help them form or at least be kind of something that's uh, causally related. Okay, um, so that that's kind of a vague an unspecific thing to say. So let me be more specific and let's talk about a particular system where we have inner super earths and we have an outer giant companion. So this system is called Kepler-167. It's a really special and unique system because it is one of the very few systems detected by Kepler where we see three inner planets transiting. And we also see two transits of an outer gas giant companion. And this is really unusual because the orbital period of this outer companion um, is, uh, let's see, it's a couple of years. So we barely just managed to, to catch two transits during the four year Kepler survey baseline. So the um, semi-major axis of the outer companion is 1.9 AU, which places us out beyond the orbit of Mars, not quite as far as Jupiter, but, but getting pretty far out there. Uh, it's only one of 15 long period gas giants um, detected by Kepler, and most of those just had a single transit, so we don't know their orbital periods. But for this one, we detect two transits, so we know going in its size and we know its distance. What we don't know is we don't know its mass. So we know it's about 90% the size of Jupiter based on the um, depth of the transit. But obviously, if we want to model the dynamical evolution of the protoplanetary disk and how it was affected by the presence of this giant planet, what we really want to know is what the mass of this planet is. So um, this was a, a project led by another grad student in my group, um, Yeadi Chachin. So um, Yeadi uh, took um, radial velocity data, um, which we obtained using the Keck telescope. This was a tough study for radial velocity because the star is very faint, much fainter than most stars observed using this technique. And because the orbital period of the planet we were trying to detect was um, very long, we had to observe for multiple years. So the orbital period was about three years. We observed for uh, three and a half, close to four years. And here you can see the radial velocity signal of this gas giant companion as a function of time. And there's a clear detection of the signal, which means we have a good, well-constrained measurement of the planetary mass. Um, so even though the planet is a little bit smaller than Jupiter, it turns out that it's exactly Jupiter's mass, which means it's a little bit denser than Jupiter. Um, we can fit the mass and the radius with a model that lets us estimate the amount of solids, rock, water, ice, things like that. And we find that this planet seems to contain about 60 Earth masses of solids, which is more than Jupiter. Okay, um, the other really cool thing that Yadi did was to actually model the evolution of the protoplanetary disk that might have formed the system. And uh, so the framework that he used was the pebble accretion framework. So the idea is you um, have a, a lunar mass core that you put down in the outer disk, you allow it to grow in mass by accreting pebbles 
Um, and while it's growing, some of the pebbles move past the planet and migrate into the inner disk. Others are accreted. So the time average accretion efficiency in these simulations is only about 10%. So a lot of pebbles make it past the growing core into the inner disk. But eventually the core grows big enough that it perturbs the density structure of the gas in the disk, creating um, over densities on either side. And those over densities trap the migrating pebble. So once the planet reaches the pebble isolation mass, it shuts off the flow of solids to the inner disk. So the only material that's available to form super earths is the material that either started in the inner disk or has migrated through while the core was still growing. So Yayati used these models to calculate how much solid material makes it through to the inner disk and to ask whether that's enough solid material to form the system of inner super earths. Um, we don't know what the properties of the original disk was that formed the system. So he considered a grid of models with a variety of sizes and a variety of masses. And he also varied where he put down the seed of the giant planet core, and he varied when he placed the seed into the disk. So this is just a, a quick snapshot. Um, so of the subset of simulations that formed a giant planet, not all of them were able to but a subset of them did. Um, those simulations, you can track the amount of material reaching the inner disk as a function of time. And so this, um, don't worry too much about the differences between the curves. The key thing is that the gray shaded region represents um, two different thresholds for the minimum amount of solids we need to form super earths. And you can see that the, um, the filled circles, which represent the total mass budget of material that reaches the inner disk uh, when the core reaches the isolation mass, um, all of these disks, which formed the giant planet, also delivered more than enough solids to the inner disk to form super Earths. Okay, um, we can also look specifically at the Kepler-167 system. Um, so there are a couple of constraints here. One is that we know we have to deliver enough solids to the inner disk to make the super Earths. So that's that threshold I just showed you. We know we need to make a giant planet, which in this case means we need to um, successfully form a large core, which is to say the core reaches the pebble isolation mass before the gas disk dissipates. So we have an upper limit on the core formation timescale of about a million years. And we also know that our core has to accrete a total of 66 earth masses of solids. Um, part of this is obviously the core. We think um, in our models, the core typically tops out at 10 to 20 earth masses. So there's gotta be extra solids still left in the outer disk that the planet will continue to accrete to make up the rest of that mass budget of 66 earth masses. So with those three requirements, we can ask what were the properties of the protoplanetary disk that would have been able to form this kind of system? And is it plausible that a disk would have had those kinds of properties? So here's a plot of young disks in the Orion star forming region, um, including the size of the disk in AU and the solid, estimated solid mass of the disk in Earth masses. Um, focus on the red points, which we think are the most sort of realistic um, characterization. So it depends on how you measure each of these things. And I'm happy to explain that later if anyone has questions, but um, focus on the red dots. Um, we think that the Kepler-167 system must have formed from disks which lie above the black line. So things which are uh, larger than a few, larger than about hundred AU, give or take, and which have more solid mass, uh, which have at least several hundred earth masses of solids. But that's about 10 to 20% of all the protoplanetary disks. So it's not unreasonable to think that uh, the system might have formed from that kind of disk. All right, I know I'm coming to the end of my time. So let me just circle back briefly to the question that I asked at the beginning of this section, which is what is the effect of an outer gas giant on an inner super earth system? Does it keep super earths from forming or um, is there some sort of link between the two? So um, both our observations and our models tell us that although the giant planets do restrict the flow of solids to the inner disk, that this is not a problem for forming super Earths because these disks are preferentially large and metal and rich in solids. So even with this, there's still plenty of stuff to form the inner super Earths. 
Um, most of the time, the giant planet is far enough out that it's not a significant dynamical influence on the inner systems, particularly if everything is coplanar. I didn't talk about that much here. Happy to talk about it later. Um, so we think that the key takeaway here is this bottom one, that the presence of a giant planet tells you that the original disk was relatively large and relatively rich in solids, and that those kinds of disks are also the ones that will preferentially form large rocky planets in the inner region of the disk. Okay, so I've covered a lot of ground today. Um, let me just go back to the original picture that I showed you with a couple of examples of exoplanetary systems. So remember that we said that in the inner regions uh, of these planetary systems, we frequently find large planets, that those planets can be divided into two populations, depending on whether or not they have a hydrogen and helium rich envelope. The closest in planets are rocky and lost their primordial atmosphere. The more distant planets have been able to hold on to their atmosphere and that puffs them up and in increases their apparent size. Um, we tested that hypothesis using a number of different observations and found that by and large, that story seems to hold up. Um, and lastly, we explored um, the possible effect that outer gas giant planets might have on the structures of the inner interplanetary systems. And we found that um, large uh, disks that are rich in solids are the ones that most readily form outer gas giants and that those disks are also the ones that can easily form these large rocky planets in the inner region. And that this is a very sort of different mode uh, or channel of planet formation than we see in the solar system, which is mostly empty in the inner region and has relatively small rocky planets. All right, um, I think I am almost at the hour. So let me end there and ask if anyone has any questions.